We're living in a time, friends, and I'm sure you can agree, there is a lot of artificial light everywhere. Artificial man-made sound everywhere. It sounds like God, but there's no texture of God on it. In the church, we love to amplify personalities, where it's all about the speaker, the reason why a lot of these churches are growing is not because the Spirit of God is moving on them, it's because they found a formula to mix sensuality with spirituality. God wants something better than this. So, if you have a Bible, could I just ask you to turn to Proverbs 22 to 29. Proverbs 22 to 29. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. You know, every king that we speak to, every king we stand before is always a step down from the king that we meet in our prayer closet. Can anyone say amen? Amen. We can meet with kings, but we know the king of kings, so we're not as excited to meet you as you think we would be. (laughs) You know, many of us have got different gifts But every one of us has got a voice in God. And our job is to steward that voice well. We are not called to speak in an earthly way. We are called to speak the oracles of God. We are called to declare the mystery of Christ around. We are not called to sound like everyone else who isn't saved. Can I get an amen? Amen. And for me, I want my voice to be so filled with God that when I would lift up my voice, kings and nations would take note, not because I am special, but because they can hear the texture of God on my voice. John the Baptist had a powerful voice. John the Baptist had a powerful, powerful voice. When he spoke, kings sat up and took notice. When he spoke, the demons got concerned about what was going to come next. His voice rattled the religious spirit. It rattled the spirits around. And it says in the Bible that God even filled John the Baptist with the Holy Spirit as he was being knitted together in his mother's womb. So he grew up filled with the Spirit of God. And because there was a mighty infilling, then there was a mighty message upon his lips. That is how you get an actual message. You have a mighty infilling first. Isaiah prophesied about John, and I love this. Isaiah prophesied about John that he was the voice. He was the voice. What an amazing thing that for the Bible to say, he's the voice. He's the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. If you're crying out, it shows how intrinsically connected you are to God. Often with Christians, is they are excited and crying out when they're talking about sport but the moment it gets into prayer they look awkward and bored and they just sit on the floor and just say amen because they've run out of capacity in 10 minutes you know uh, pastor Yong Yi Cho who pastored one of the biggest churches in South Korea like which is like 500,000 people or something like that He would pray five hours a day, and he would have this light-hearted running joke about the West. I'm from the West, so I can speak about the West. Okay? (laughs) So, 
pastors from the West would come over and he would say, I just want us to pray. Pastors would come over to learn the formula of why it was working. And what he would do is he just said to the pastors from the West, can we just pray for one hour? And he said this would happen every single time. He said they would pray fervently for 10 minutes and then they would just sit on the floor and just say amen to other people's prayers because they were knackered. They got spiritual cramp very, very early. And I like light-hearted jokes like that because I'm like, I'm Western. I don't want to be in that conversation. I don't want to be in that conversation. When John raised up his voice because he was such a prayer person, there was a divine unction connected. There was a texture connected to it. So even the surrounding cities had to listen to him because of the divine unction on his spirit, on his spirit but on his voice. And then his voice started to move all of Israel. And this verse I will never recover from, Mark 1.5. It says that all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him and confessing their sins by the river Jordan. Can you imagine the turmoil and the chaos and the confusion in the enemy's camp when they are seeing droves of people leaving the city to the sound of repentance? Can you imagine the confusion of what is going on right now? Why is so, it says all, why is so many people leaving the city to the sound of repentance? John then starts to use his God-given voice to direct those who cannot see truth to the truth. So he points at Jesus and he says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So out of all the religious rhetoric and garbage of the day, his voice is literally directing the traffic, the flow to truth itself. That is powerful. Is anyone thinking that's powerful? Okay. Listen, this shows that when God fully gets a hold of someone's life and he fills them with his spirit, (laughs) They have a mighty message. They have a profound message. They have a call. They have a cry. Their voice is not generic. It's genuine. One of the reasons I love hearing James is he has a genuine voice, not a generic voice. And that is what the heaven is picking up the frequency on. And I want to tell you this. When you have a true voice of God, people will respond to your voice whether good or bad, but they will respond because our life is meant to have a fragrance of life and death on it. Some people would be the fragrance of life, some people are the fragrance of death, but we're all called to have a fragrance. Some people have no fragrance because they're living in the middle lane. Do you have a fragrance to your voice? If, you, if your church packed up where they were staying and moved, would the town even miss your voice? Would your street even miss your voice if you left your house? Does your voice matter? Has it got the texture of God on it? There is always a movement of the Spirit on a person's voice who has the texture of God on it. It's good or bad in, in, in terms of how people are going to receive it. Some people are going to scoff. Some people are going to be thankful. Some people are going to shout at you. Some people are going to shout for joy. It's going to create some sort of Um, reaction because the word of God always pierces the hearts of the hearers you know when you lift up your voice and you're filled with the Holy Spirit people cannot ignore it they cannot sideline you as some religious nut job only they have to listen to it they have to listen to it when I um, uh, most of my family original family they're not Christians My mum became a Christian recently, which was the first person other than me to become a Christian. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) I actually led her to the Lord over the phone during work. (laughs) Anyway, that's that's always a good time to get saved. (laughs) I was like, excuse me, boss, can I just have a little bit more time? I've just got a big call. Okay, so... My, basically, my dad had uh, passed away, he died a couple of years ago from a really aggressive form of cancer. And so when my younger sister was getting married, 
she said to me, would you like to do the father of the bride speech? And so any time I would speak anywhere, Christian venue or non-Christian, I will always include the word of God. In any venue, in anywhere. I find that incredibly easy to do. That's, that's why God has given me a voice to speak about him. So I'm doing the sister of the, um, what's it called? The father of the bride speech. And I had to just let people know that I wasn't my sister's dad, you know, because I would think a few people are going to be like, you look younger than your sister. Anyway, so anyway, I start to lace my talk with the word of God. I'm not joking. I had, there was no Christians there. There was about 100 people in the room. There was, I think, about two Christians there. I had nearly every man at that wedding come and talk to me about God afterwards. Just off a 10-minute talk, because I always choose to put him center. Always choose to put him center. Don't just feature him in, put him center. Because I want to tell you this. People want to hear the Word of God. They don't hear the Word of God. It is interesting to them. It is rare to them to hear some wisdom that didn't come from the earth. If you think John's good, Jesus is even better. Now, I love Jesus. (laughs) And one thing I would teach for years is about we need to decrease so Jesus can increase. Who has heard this? But Jesus gave me a revelation of that's not fully right, Matt. He said that John said about him that now, John, I need to decrease so Jesus can increase. But Jesus didn't say that. John said that. Jesus said you had to die. (laughs) Jesus said you don't need to decrease, you need to decease. Now, the problem is with the West is we love a slow death. We love to be shot with a tranquilizer gun and slowly make our way to death. But Jesus is saying, no, no, speeding up your death. (laughs) I love it when James says that God wants to kill your flesh. Yeah, God wants to kill your flesh, but the devil wants to use your flesh. Now, Jesus in Luke 4, 31, I... Love this with all my heart, this verse. Jesus in Luke 4, uh, 4, 31. He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, a holy one of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. I love that. Jesus won't even receive worship from demons. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the mist, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And then they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For what with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And reports about Jesus then went out into every place in the surrounding region. The moment a holy one lifts up his voice, the demons get nervous. Did you know, friends, that your voice, because it has the texture of God on it, your voice is meant to cause demons panic attacks. Some of you have been struggling with anxiety for a long time. You need to start investing anxiety into the demons. The demons don't shudder because I'm on the scene with a new haircut and skinny jeans and some fun stories about my kids. The demons shudder because the Holy Spirit is on me. What I love about this verse is I always ask the question, Jesus comes in the synagogue and starts teaching and a man with an unclean spirit then cries out, how long had that man been in that synagogue? How long had that demon, unclean spirit, been sitting there comfortable around other people's teachings? Are demons, I think James said this yesterday, are demons comfortable around your voice or are they scared around your voice? 
How long had this man been in here? But the moment a holy one comes up and lifts up his voice, whatever the gifting is, he was teaching in this moment, then there is always a reaction. There is always a reaction. People cannot ignore it. So John, when he spoke as well, he always created some sort of frenzy of activity because it says in Isaiah 55 that when his word goes out from his mouth, it shall not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish what it purposed to do and succeed in the thing in which it got sent. So when John the Baptist would lift up his voice, the poor would come, the religious would come, those who are weighed down with their sins would come. People came at the sound at his voice and the people in power sat up and took notice of the voice. They sat up and they took notice of this voice because this voice started to steal the peace from the powerful. It started to remove the peace from their ungodly lifestyles. And now they had to react to this voice. The only way to get rid of John's voice was to get rid of John's head. They sent him to prison, but that was, but that was not ample. So they had to also cut his head off because the voice was so convicting, it was probably keeping them up at night. We're living in a time, friends, and I'm sure you can agree, there is a lot of artificial light everywhere. Artificial man-made sound everywhere. It sounds like God, but there's no texture of God on it. The Pharisees looked beautiful and religious, but heaven only felt the undertones of hypocrisy and lawlessness on their voice. So they looked the part, but their voice was completely and utterly off. I want to say this. Whatever your ministry is, you need your voice for it. Amen. That is your weapon. I am surprised, particularly with evangelists, how sloppy they are with their mouths when they're not evangelizing. They are, so, honestly, sometimes they are the sloppiest people with their voice. Just because you lead people to Christ doesn't mean you can be unholy with your, with your tongue. What did God say when he said, Get away from me. I never knew you. They referred to him as Lord, so they referred to him as being a Christian. He then talked about their mighty works. And then he said, depart from me. Why? It's not an abstract thing. He said, you workers of lawlessness. You workers of lawlessness. It shows something is completely missing in your understanding about why God saved you. Whatever the ministry that God has for you, you need your voice to be textured with God for it. If you're an evangelist, you need to proclaim. If you're a teacher, you need to expand. If you're a prophet, you need to share. If you're an apostle, you need to bring the sound of God into a territory. Yes. If you're a pastor, it's not about just being a nice guy. You have to have the texture of God on the words that you are speaking. Yes. Even if you think, I'm not any of those things, you're still a prayer, and it says, when you pray, say... Amen, amen. Yeah. Amen. Your voice matters. One of the things that really always uh, provided me information of how real this is, is I remember reading uh, a minister who years ago went and saw a man of God. He's died now, a guy called Lennon Ravenhill. And he said he went to see him preach. And when Lennon Ravenhill preached, he basically at the end just sat down quietly and prayed. Then all of a sudden, the spirit of conviction would come on hundreds of people in the room, and they were still there for four straight hours afterwards groaning. And the minister going to see this said, I've never seen anyone just do a teaching, and then people are on the floor for four hours afterwards. And he said, years later, I got to ask Leonard Ravenhill, how can I have that on my ministry? Leonard Ravenhill said this. He said, only one way. He said, not just long hours of prayer. He said, it will take your whole life giving it to God. He said, you have to give your time, your eyes, and your voice to God. Don't live differently outside of the prayer room to how you live in the world. And he said, whenever the spirit of prayer would touch him in his personal life, then there was always a power manifestation in the public preaching. 
So whatever gifting you have, you want the texture of God on it. So it cannot be ignored. You know, there's many voices that we hear. There's many artificial lights. There's many voices coming from churches, let's be honest, that are not churches. I loved it when James said a while back, he said, things that we are calling church, heaven is not calling a church. Let's be honest, many churches that are coming up now, they're not churches, they're shops. They're shops looking for customers, and their leaders would be better placed in a boy band than in a pulpit. Because they're more interested in in their hair than they are in prayer. They're more interested in their fashion than the passion. They're more interested in collecting fans for their show than they are making disciples. You need the texture of God. And I want to say this. The reason there is no texture of God on it, and the reason why you have to make up with so much entertainment to keep the show going, is because they are doing it for the wrong God. Not just selfish ambition. They are literally doing it for the wrong God. Have you ever put food in a food bin before and smelt the food bin? Anyone smell that? That food that you were just giving thanks for a minute ago and saying, thank you, Lord, for this amazing food. The leftovers then you put in the food bin and then it get mixed with all the other foods it was never meant to be connected to. So when heaven smells the aroma, it is a mixed It it is off. That's the only way to say it. The the smell is off to heaven. The smell is off to heaven. The mixture is off. um, James 3.16 says this, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. You can bind and rebuke the devil all day long, But if your church is rooted in selfish ambition, you will always be the landing strip for his re-entry. You are the landing strip because of your selfish ambition. We can do things for the wrong God. Who knows there's more than one Jesus? There's a false Jesus. Just because you lift up the name of Jesus doesn't mean you're speaking to the Jesus that we are talking about in the Bible. You know, this story rocks me to the core. And I feel like it summarizes that really well. There was a guy, um, uh, an American guy called Howard Pittman. And he was a Christian. And he basically was on, he was going to the town to become sheriff of the town. And he was going to like some sort of ceremony to make him the sheriff of the town. On the way to being made the sheriff of the town, he starts to have a hemorrhage and he starts to bleed and he starts to pass out. And he's basically going into a form of death. When he starts to enter into death, this verse comes before his eyes. And it says this. It says, Hebrews 9, 27. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, comes before his eyes three times. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, he then starts to, be dra- he starts to be pulled towards hell. And he's thinking, why am I being pulled towards hell? I'm a Christian. He starts to stand outside this gate. And the angel says to him, plead your case before God. You're not even allowed in. Plead your case outside the gate to God. Why you should not be going to hell. He's perplexed. He starts to talk about every single work he has ever done for God. He starts to go through and list. And do you know what was amazing? God never interrupted him. God never interrupted him once. He let him finish. He he then spoke to God about every single work that he had done. God never interrupted him. The moment he had finished his plead in his case, God then speaks and said, every work you ever did, you did it for the God of self. He said, you did it for Satan's favorite idol, the God of self. Everything you did in ministry was for the God of self. You know, God knows who really, really wants a microphone and who really, really wants him. He knows who wants this and who wants him. 
The goal of Christianity isn't to say something profound on a microphone and for one day someone to think you're good enough to to speak at a conference. The goal of Christianity is to have Christ formed in you. It's for your life to have Christ-likeness and for his kingdom to come through you. You know, the microphone is given by men to men, but a voice is given by God. The microphone likes to amplify what men like. But God gives a voice to emphasize what men really need to hear. Did you notice that John the Baptist never even had a microphone? And yet the entire city went out to his voice. In the church, we love to amplify personalities, don't we? Where it's all about the speaker, it's all about what's happening in their personal life, and then they always just chuck in Joshua 1.9 as the, the scripture. For haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous, to be like me, the preacher. God wants something better than this. He doesn't, listen, the reason why a lot of these churches are growing is not because the Spirit of God is moving on them. It's because they found a formula to mix sensuality with spirituality. That is why they are growing. And so when you lift up your voice to God as a church, and your, your church is a cocktail of sensuality and spirituality, <laughs> it doesn't register in heaven. It might impress men, but it doesn't register in heaven. Jesus said this, he who is of the earth belongs to the earth and he speaks in an earthly way. But he who is from heaven comes from above and is above all. Now this is the main emphasis I want to talk about my preach. What is a key thing that John and Jesus both did? They both spoke directly to kings. I'm not talking in an abstract way. I'm talking face to face with the kings of those days, of different governors of different realms. They spoke face to face with them. Can I ask you a question, especially for those in the UK? When was the last time you saw on BBC News a proper man or woman of God speaking directly to the prime minister about his compromise and his unholy living. <laughs> Didn't just speak to them about their charity or their issues of the day, which obviously have a place, but was actually directly talking about their lifestyle before God in front of people. John the Baptist did that. John the Baptist in 6, 8, Mark 6.18 says, For John had been saying to King Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He had been saying, so he had been speaking to him, not trying to gain points off him, but actually speaking to him about what heaven wanted to speak to King Herod about. Listen, this is when you know that you are truly carrying something awesome in God. Is when the elite leader can't just dismiss you as a religious nut job. They can't just sideline you of like, oh, they're just some religious weirdo. You know, let's just ignore them. They can't actually ignore your voice. Do you know what it says in the Bible? It says in Mark 6.20, it said that Herod feared John. King Herod feared John. And it said because he feared him, he even protected John because he knew that he was a righteous and a holy man. When Herod heard John, it said that King Herod was puzzled because he liked to listen to John. Isn't that, from, isn't that fascinating? John's voice disturbed the peace from the powerful. It disturbed them. It disturbed the life of them. They couldn't just indulge in what they had been indulging in because now that voice was convicting them. It was utterly alarming. It was utterly alarming. Now, stepping up from, Jesus, uh, from John again, it's Jesus. Jesus always has the next highest thing, right? Jesus spoke directly to three kings of different realms. 
didn't he? Face to face. Isn't this interesting? Jesus spoke to the chief priests, the religious leaders. He spoke to the secular leaders in Pontius Pilate. He spoke to the satanic leaders in Satan. He spoke to King Herod. He spoke directly face to face with these people. And I find the interaction with each of these kings interesting. And I want you to take note of this. Because if you're going to have a voice in your nation, you're going to need to know how to deal with kings. You're going to need to know what Jesus knew so you can approach it in the same manner. How did Jesus deal with King Herod? This, is, this verse absolutely touches me. It says, when King Herod saw Jesus... When King Herod finally saw Jesus, it said that he was very glad because he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. King Herod actually had a desire to hear from him. When was the last time Boris Johnson had a desire to hear from you? When was the last time your king in your country, your president, had a desire to hear your voice? You will stand before men, not just before obscure men. Jesus also knew when to use his voice and when not to use his voice. This is a very crucial part. You need to know when to speak and when not to speak. And that adds to your voice. When Jesus then was speaking with the governor, Pontius Pilate, it says in Matthew 27, 11 to 14, it says this. Now Jesus stood... Again, before the governor. And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests, obviously he stood before them as well, and elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify you? But he gave them no answer. He gave Pontius Pilate no answer, not even to a single charge. And it said that the governor was greatly amazed. Isn't that powerful? To know even the most elite person in front of you, they can't control your voice. They can't control you. You serve a greater voice. This has always rocked me, this one little fact. You know that Jesus likes to ask many questions but he doesn't like to answer many questions. Did you know that? Jesus loves to ask you, he knows the answer, but he loves to ask you questions, many questions, but he doesn't like to answer many questions. Do you know in the Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions? Did you know that? In the Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions. Jesus himself was then asked 183 questions. Did you know that? So he asked 307. He got asked 183. Out of the 183, do you know how many he answered? Three. (laughs) Just because you ask Jesus something does not mean he will respond. You need to discern his will, and then he will respond to your question. Okay, let's look at how Jesus <laughs> dealt with Satan. I could, we could preach for four hours on that. I'm just going to highlight one point because I think it's very, very key. Jesus, when he's facing the devil in the wilderness and he's talking to him, it says that the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. I want to say, whoever Jesus is speaking to, it doesn't matter. Jesus' voice is always, it always embodies the truth of God. Jesus' voice always has the most amount of God's counsel on it. And Jesus says the very purpose of why he even bothered to come into this world was to bear witness to the truth. Jesus always and only speaks the truth. 
Jesus always and only speaks the truth. And Jesus is a good shepherd. So if he sees that you are a wolf, he will speak the truth to you and he will tell you the reasons why you do the things that you do. He will not sweeten or dilute his voice for your taste. That is a key thing that you need to learn as an evangelist. Don't sweeten or dilute your voice for their taste. The reason he does not hold back is because he knows that the truth will set people free. That is why he does not, he's not thinking about himself, he's thinking about you. How did Satan deal, try to deal with Jesus? This is a really interesting point. You know, Satan wants to kill, deal, steal, and destroy, right? Do you know one of the key ways that Satan tries to steal from you? He tries to give you something. Again, the devil took him to the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, he said to Jesus, all these I will give to you. What's Satan trying to give to you? That is how he's going to steal from you. He's not just taking from you. He's trying to give you something because he wants to nullify your voice. Always ask the question, what is he trying to give to you? He's trying to distract you and nullify, like I said, your voice. So three things that you need to listen to right now in dealing with kings. Number one, you need to realize that greater pressure will come when you are dealing with a king. Greater, greater pressure than you ever felt before will come when you are dealing with a king. This is why, because at their disposal, they are not an obscure man. They have more at their disposal. They have more people at their disposal. They have public opinion at their disposal. They have power at their disposal. They have pounds. They have money at their disposal. That is why the pressure will be greater, and that is why you have to be prepared even greater. Appetites is a big thing that the enemy or kings will try and use a tool against you. Let's read Proverbs 23, 1 to 3. Proverbs 23, 1 to 3. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you. And put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive foods. Observe means pay attention to what the enemy is trying to give you through this process. Observe, pay attention to how they're trying to flatter you. Appetites. It's talking about a lack of self-control. Self-control is not about just having discipline. It is a fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? It should grow off your tree. How do you grow good fruit? Does anyone know? How do you grow good fruit? There's only one way. You become a good tree. Only a good tree can bear good fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit. And a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So you have to become a good tree in the spirit, in your identity, to bear good fruit. It's not about discipline and watching loads of motivation videos. It's an actual fruit that grows off you. It's not a fruit that you force out. It grows off you. I'm going to say something now, which I never share this testimony. I know James always says I have lots of testimonies. This testimony, I will never, ever, ever forget. And I hope you never, ever forget it. And I never share this testimony because it makes me a bit embarrassed. But I'm going to share it because I'm going to show you the precision in which the enemy will attack you with. I came to Christ 15 years ago. When I came to Christ, my life before then was just made up of in and out of relationships like a lot of people. When I became a Christian, I still had a porn problem. And I kept going in and out of it through the years. And I struggled with it, sorry, for the first number of seasons. And that used to always get me down. 
If you think about, unfortunately, how many porn websites in the world, there must be about a billion, is one of the most popular things on the internet, so you can imagine how many websites. There was one porn website I used to always go to, a random one. When I became a Christian, and I was in the first year of being a Christian, and when I was a part of a local church for the first time in my life, when you come into the church, you think everyone's perfect except for you. So you think everyone's godly. You just see the mannerisms around you. You know, listen, the religious spirit isn't in just in the Church of England or things like that. Or where we always like to say, oh, the, the religious spirit is. No, no, it's in every denomination, the religious spirit. It's like the Play-Doh spirit. It just molds itself to what looks holy in the room. It's the Play-Doh spirit, the religious spirit. And it's in everywhere, in every denomination. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Okay, back to my, back to my interesting story. So this one porn website I would go to, random one, right? And so I'm, one, I'm, one, I'm, I'm basically a new Christian, so I'm learning all the ropes, I'm learning all the Bible, and I'm at a daytime Christian party. A daytime Christian party with all the holy people that I've become <laughs> friends with. The day, the, I wasn't in a nightclub, the daytime Christian party, I'm now leaving to go to the station to go home. On the way home, one of the uh, girls who I'd always see worshiping, worshiping in church, like really vibrantly, she comes alongside me. She says, where are you going now? I said, I'm going home. She said, do you want to come back to my flat for a bit? She then said, do you want to come and watch this porn website with me? And she named the very one. Think about that. Out of a billion, she names, I've never even heard anyone say it out loud, and she named it to me. She said, come and watch this with me. It felt like the Satan was right there with me at that point, and I was a young Christian, but God causes us not to stumble. And I said, no. I said no, and I never saw her again, even though I went to that church for another two years. Isn't that, I just want you, to, I don't like sharing that testimony because it, it makes me feel weird, but I want you to get into grips with the precision the enemy will attack you with. He will go for the very thing to tempt you with. He's not random in his attacks of you. He has a structured plan. Listen, when he left heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. So his, his resources are limited. So he has to use other measures and he won't waste his time on scattergun approaches with you. He wants to hone in on the appetite that he sees in you. I love, it says... If you are given to appetite, put a knife to your throat. What is he saying? It's the same uncomfortable hard language that Jesus says about when he says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's uncomfortable language. He's saying, kill the passage where sin and appetite keep coming through. Cut off the passage to it. <laughs> oh. You know, listen, the reason why the devil loves to work so much in appetite and sin cycles is because he can control you through that process. He knows if you are in a sin cycle, it steals your confidence in God. And you won't pray much and you won't evangelize much because you will feel like a hypocrite. That is why he wants to control you in a sin cycle. And listen, when you see a spider web, you often don't see the spider. Have you noticed that? But you see the web. Every time you pull down that web, guess what? When you come back the next day, the spider web is rebuilt. You have to kill the spider. Otherwise, you will never deal with the web. Is this good so far? Are you, are you excited? I'm excited. It says also about, do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive foods. 
What is a delicacy? It's something that you think is special. And it will be tailor-made to you of something you feel is special. Listen, the enemy knows of what websites and what programs you watch when you're not in church. So he can gather intel on the appetite that you have. And he will use that delicacy to bring before you to nullify your voice. Our voice is always called to have weight to it in the spirit. It's always called to matter. The truth that we embody our words with matters. I once said to my mom, my mom was like, not a Christian yet. I said, I was just getting a bit excited. And I said to my mom, I said, you know what the prophetic word, the most, one of the most prophetic words I've ever received is? I said, one of the most prophetic words I've ever received is, I will speak before kings. And I said that to my mom. And my mom said, oh, that's nice. And I think she pictures some sort of royal event. I said, hang on a minute, mum. Don't get so happy. I said, John the Baptist had his head cut off. And I said, Jesus got crucified. She said, oh. She said, do you want a cup of tea? I said, yes, please. True story. I know how things are going to go. I know we're going to cry out for our voice very soon. But that voice could cost you your life. And are you willing for that voice? People in power won't like that you are taking the peace away from them. <laughs> oh. One more thing, controversial thing to say. So, because the enemy is limited in his resources, he has to use the airwaves well. So he has to use music, he has to use music, music, uh, movies and radios and things like that to transmit his lawless lies everywhere. I remember once standing up in a Christian meeting and I just said this. I said, who here likes the song by Pharrell Williams, Happy? Because I'm happy, da, 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 da. happiness is the truth, because I'm happy. Does anyone know that song? Yes. I said... That is the most demonic song of the year. <laughs> People started to melt in their seats after they'd just been singing it at me. <laughs> I said, that is the most demonic song of this year. They were perplexed, like you were. It's called Happy, it sounds happy. The key line in the song that it gets everyone to sing along to, and listen, pop music in particular, it's a form of meditation. That's why it repeats itself. So that's how it gets the culture discipled in lawlessness. Because it's getting them meditating on it all the time. Oh, my days. Oh, my days. The key line, the key line in this song that everyone, even the Christians are singing along to it. Because I'm happy, sing along. Duh, duh, duh. Because happiness is a truth. Happiness is a truth. If you go and evangelize to a lot of people in the West, what is the current lie that they always say? Well, whatever makes you happy, as long as you're not hurting anyone. So Satan employs his demonic worship leaders into the pop world. He employs the demon. I'm not got anything against Pharrell Williams, okay? Just so you know, he's just a person being used by the devil. But the devil... <laughs> Pharrell Williams, if you're listening, maybe just get a thumbs up. <laughs> Listen, whether you know Pharrell Williams or not, or even things like Ariana Grande, do you know how many views on one platform Happy has? It has, has 1.2 billion views. Just on one platform, on one video. It's probably about 3 billion billion views of people meditating on that lie. Happiness is a truth. If you look at the music video to that, this is so funny. You need to see it just so you can see it. He is at one point directing 
the worship team, the choir in a church, and they are singing along to that song with him. And they have removed the cross from their garments. Isn't that funny that Satan knew what was coming, that celebrities would dictate the worship? Did anyone get that? He is literally dictating what they are singing. Clap along if you think that happiness is a truth. Whether you know about these people or not, I don't listen to these people, obviously, but I know about the patterns that how the enemy works. Even with Ariana Grande, even if you just went on like five of her top songs on YouTube, it comes to about seven billion views. So it's making a big sound in the earth. It's because of how the enemy has prepared the ground and then he releases an anthem over that nation and then that lie becomes a stronghold. I want to say this. When Jesus is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. I want to put a bigger imagination in you. I want to put a bigger dream in you. Imagine if you released a song or you released a message and 1.2 billion people repented of it. If the enemy can try and do it, God can do much better. I think we need to start big, thinking bigger in the billions of people coming to Christ. But we need a sound of repentance on our voice. Our voice, your voice, I want you to say to the person next to you, your voice is not called to be sidelined. Say it to the person on the other side, the same thing. Your voice is called to have the texture of God on it. It is called to have the sound of repentance on it. Can I just have the worship guys, uh, the Lloyd and that come up on the, on the keys? Your voice is not meant to sound like the earth. It's meant to sound like a different culture. It's meant to have a magnitude on it. It's meant to have a sound of purity on it. It's meant to have the sound of power on it. It's meant to disturb kings. Your voice. No longer will your voice be sidelined. No longer just playing the game, singing along with the Satan and all his worship leaders. Your voice is sacred and it needs to be consecrated. Let's just, let's just start to pray, right? And we're going to just start to touch it. I want to start to travel in prayer for a little while. And we're going to start to touch on some of these things. Can, we, can you stand right now? I just want you to start to pray in the Spirit now. Intensely. Just start to pray in the Spirit now. Rabaka sanda la 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 baka sanda yan malaki ya baba ba la baka sanda la li ama baba ba ba tanda ki ya babo kosonya rabaka sanda ya makosanda ki ya baba la kanda na makasi anda la la baka sati ya mamo kosata ya rabaka zaka ti anda la la baka sandi ya mama rabaka sati anda la 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 baka sanda kata ya oh rabaka zaka ti anda la la baba ba Oh rabaka saka ti andara laba oh rabaka sandara ni andara laba ika dara rabaka sandara kataye oh rabaka taye nana 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 kanda rabaka saka taye oh rabaka saka taye oh rabaka saka ti andara laba rabaka sandara dada ila lala kanda lala baka sata ye ila lala kanda lala baka ndaya oh rabaka sandara kataye ila lala baka sandara ki andara la oh rabaka sandara ki mama Oh, Rabaka Sakatia Nananama. Oh, Rabaka Sakatia Baba Baba Baba. Makazaka Talia Baga Sakataye. Ila la la baka sanda la la baka sanda kayaye. Ila la la baka sanda la la kanda la la baka sanda kia rabaka sataye. 
Ora baka sanda kataye, nana naka sanda di ambala baka sanda la baka sataye. Ora baka zaka taye, yana nana maka zaka tayana. Ora baka zaka tiana da da baka zaka tiama. Masaka taye, ina nana maka zada le ama ba 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 ba. Ora baka zaka taye, ora baka zaka taye. Masaka tiana da 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 ba 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 ma 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 ma. Ora baka nana naka da 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 ba ba. Ila la 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 ba ka la ba ka sa da 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 la ba 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 ba. Ila la 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 ba ka sa ka ta ya. I ka da 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 la ba ka sa ka ta ya. Ma sa ka ta ya. Ila la la ba ka sa da re ba ka ya ma ka sa da ya ya ba. Ila la la ba ka ra ha da 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 re. Ila la 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 ka da ya ma 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 ha na na ma. I ka ka ta ya ha da da ba ka sa da 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 da. Ila la ka da da ba ka sa ta ya ma la la ba. I ka da da la ba 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 ba. Ra ba ka sa da ya na 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 ka ta ya ma 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 ma. La ka sa. Da 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 ba 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 ba. Oh, Rabba ka da 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 ba 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 ba. Start to pursue God now. Start to pursue God now. And ask God, is there anything nullifying my voice right now? Ask the Lord yourself, is there anything nullifying the voice of God, the texture of God on my voice? Rabba ka da 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 ma 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 ma. Rabba ka da 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 ba 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 ba. Oh, Rabba ka sanda ka ta. in the spirit but many of our voices have been contaminated by the things of the earth we are called to be a voice in the heavens but if we're going to be a, a voice in the heavens like John we have to have deep consecrations on the earth we will not be voices in the heavens 
without deep consecrations on the earth. So we're going to have an altar call right now. For where our voices have been contaminated by demonic ideologies from movies, demonic ideologies from music, demonic ideologies from the media, that which has infiltrated our psyche and caused us to not even realize that we're under the programming of the spirit of the age. We wanted to intercede for revival, but the programming of the age is running our mindset. Are you with me? This morning, we're going to break it. Yeah. We're going to break agreement with the spirit of the age. Yeah. The God of this age will not have our voice. We wanted to consecrate our voices to righteousness. That when we pray, when we preach, when we cry, the demons begin to shut up because our voices are set apart to the Lord. Oh! We turn away from the compromise. We turn away from the God of this age. We delete the, the music. We delete the voice of the enemy. We get rid. Every item that represents darkness that we have come into agreement with, breeding compromise. Lord, this morning,
second to go back up again. Last night, I received a dream from God about this moment. In the dream, there was three pythons. Every python had a different shade to it. One was green, I think one was brown, and one was albino. There was three pythons moving. Now the thing with pythons is they don't have poison. To kill you, they have to constrict you. If you are constricted, it means the air has come out of your lungs and it has now hampered your voice. I believe each snake represented a different thing. One snake represented envy. One snake represented selfish ambition. Another snake represented shame and guilt. And he's been choking people in this room with those snakes. Right now, we're gonna go back into the praying in the Spirit of God and any restriction on your voice, we're gonna break it off. Listen, the enemy will try and control you with the sin cycles. I shared the porn thing. Listen, when God broke that off my life, that was 13 years ago and I haven't had a temptation since. 13 years of freedom. So whatever the situation, we are gonna break that restriction off you right now. Yes. Amen. Let's go back into tongues right now. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, ma, 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 ma. We break off every restriction. We break off every restriction. We break off every restriction. We say the fire of God come down on every snake. In the name of Jesus, we say be free now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, ma, 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 ma. We loosen. We loosen every voice now. We loosen every voice now. We loosen every voice now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, la, ma,
the three pythons, the three pythons that Matt just spoke about. If you're implicated by any of those, just lift your hands right now. So Father, we stand before you right now in the name of Jesus. We have confessed, we have turned away. And if you haven't done that, you do that right now. Because that's what we're doing. Turning away from compromise, turning away from deception, turning away from giving our voice to the enemy. And Lord, we are coming in submission to you right now, to your authority. So therefore, right now, Father, we take authority over the python serpentine spirit. That which seeks to constrict and strangle and suffocate our voice. You serpentine spirit, we release the judgment of the Lord against you right now. We caught you off and we release the fiery judgment. The fire of the Lord begins to consume you right now. And let them go in Jesus' name. I loose, I loose your voice from the hold of the enemy. I loose your voice from the grip of the serpentine spirit. You python spirit, go now. to lose its hold some of you start to feel lightness even on your voice lightness on yourself and right now is the time to begin to rededicate your voice to the Lord rededicate your eyes to the Lord rededicate your ears to the Lord say father these ears would he hear your sound I cut off the demonic sound of Jezebel the demonic lullaby I shut it off my ears right now are dedicated to hear you. My eyes will see you, discern you. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I want to see you, so let his eyes behold you.
we thank you. We thank you for the work of your spirit in each person that's submitting themselves to your dealings right now. It's a new season, it's a new day. A new breed of intercessors are rising with voices that has not been bought by the enemy. Bold, strong, pure, consecrated voices. <laughs>